Well, Molly, Kent, we're here at the Willowbring family farm today. It's a dairy farm. It's unique in that they do a lot of grazing. Mm. And what, we, what we're standing in right now is yesterday's paddock. So we want to look at the impact of the grazing. Yeah, this is an excellent, excellent example of what we're after. Now, why are we after what we see here? We're seeing a lot of trample. We're seeing uh, uh, only a fraction of the total biomass out here being eaten. Um, and we want that. And a lot of people will see this and go, oh, good grief, look at all that forage the cows wasted. Yeah, but they call it waste, don't they? They call it waste. And, and we call it cycling nutrients. You'll often hear this uh, uh, phrase in grazing circles, take half, leave half. Right. And, and, and that's just an axiom, but this is 50% of the above ground biomass. There's, there's a lot of stuff there. The bulk of the nutrition is in the upper third of that plant. And so what we're doing here is letting the animals, and these are the, this is the lactating herd, the milking herd, yep. we want them to take the best. We don't want to force them to eat the lower stem that's lignifying here. Lignin is wood fiber. Wood fiber's not really good cow feed. The only way these plants are going to get energy to regrow is through photosynthesis through the leaves. So we have to leave leaves to help these plants rec uh, recover. When we do not graze more than 50% of the plant, we're completely protecting that root system. We're leaving leaves out here. We're able to build energy through those solar panels. This paddock's gonna recover very quickly. The other thing we're seeing out here in this trample is we're protecting the ground. We're preserving moisture in there. We're keeping that soil surface cool. And when we keep that soil surface cool, we're reducing evaporation. Most of the moisture that's here in the soil is available for plant growth and recovery. We're also providing a home and a habitat for insects and microbes that are scurrying along on the ground here. We're keeping a comfortable home for them, which is stimulating nutrient cycling, which is gonna help the overall uh, uh, nutrient density of the forage, which is gonna help those animals perform better, which is gonna create a healthier human food product down the line. So all of this stuff is connected together, and a lot of it starts if we're using that sixth principle of soil health, if you will, livestock integration. This is, this is the first year of this being a perennial seeding here, and this has full potential to just get better and better as we go on. In Mali, you know, with General Mills, I know that there's several things that are very important to you. And number one, you want to repair, restore, and rebuild ecosystems out here, uh, improve water quality. You also are focusing heavily on carbon sequestration and the ability to be able to improve our climate. And it not only includes carbon though, but it also includes the other greenhouse gases, correct? Absolutely. Yeah, it all ladders up to our greenhouse gas commitment that we made back in 2015 mm -hmm. to reduce our full value chain greenhouse gas emissions by 28%. Um, and we were the first company to do that. So this ladders up to that. So does our regenerative ag, one million acre commitment. Um, to advance regen ag practices on a million acres of farmland by 2030. Um, and this is a great example of a farm that is doing that and helping us reach that goal. A lot of this is going to become very rapidly, by the way, brand new organic matter and brand new carbon. So now we're actually putting new carbon into the soil by this high degree of trample, this, this large amount of biomass. Mm -hmm. Secondly, though, when an animal like a cow bites a plant, that's an insult to that plant, and that plant sends out signals that it needs to rapidly repair itself. But in the process of doing that, what is it doing? It is sucking a lot of carbon out of the air as it regrows, and that's precisely what we want to happen. So we actually need this grazing activity because this whole carbon cycle the biology and the soil and the plants themselves and the way they react and respond all evolved based on that ruminant grazing, browsing, and foraging activity. So they're actually critical in this whole deal. But the other thing that is important here is when we look at some of the other greenhouse gases, methane 
is a big one, sure. right? So actually, methane emission from ruminants is a very natural process, always has been. It's just that if we do it poorly and graze improperly and destroy the microbial population, we have broken that cycle. I love seeing a cover over the entire field. As far as the eye can see, you cannot see one ounce of bare soil anywhere. I like the diversity. I like, um, you know, it's very evenly grazed, you know, as you look around um, with a couple random, you know, plants left, but it's, it's pretty even. I can tell that the herd has not been grazing on this for an extended amount of time, probably just shy of a day, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and I see manure too, so I see that um, recycling of, of manure, which we know is really good for um, the environment, for the soil health, for restoring carbon and biomass into the soil. Within Understanding Ag and the Soil Health Academy, we, we always teach farmers and others that it takes biology to grow biology. You can't build biology through mechanical chemical or synthetic means. Mm -hmm. So we have biology in the soil, we have biology in the plants, we have biology in living beings like cattle. And you know, really when, like for example, when we feed a cow, we're really not feeding the cow. We're feeding the microbial environment in that cow and it's the volatile fatty acids that are feeding that cow yes. in there. And so it's, it's a microbial system in itself. There's also a microbial system around all of us there's a cloud around us of microbes. There's a cloud uh, around these cows. And as that cow moves through uh, this grass, they're shedding some of that microbe. So as we've been talking about, Alan, it's about stimulating that microbiome in there, or that microbiological community. And when we do that, those microbes create sticky substances, glomalin. And that's that glomalin that helps the mineral particles of the sto soil start forming aggregates or different size clumps. When we form aggregates in the soil, we create pore space in that soil. And when we create pore space in that soil, it allows water to infiltrate. So Molly, let me ask you, relative to harmful runoff, erosion, all of this, when you look at this impact here, how much erosion and runoff do you think can occur here? I think zero. I think they're <laughs> maximizing every inch of land they possibly could and making use of every rainfall as well and using this land as a sponge so that they can be more resistant to drought and mm -hmm. floods and keep all those nutrients right here on their land. But the other thing that is occurring here is that we are creating an ecosystem that is favorable. As, as we've been standing here, I have been observing quite a few insects, beneficial insects. I've seen quite a few lady beetles. They're, they're very powerful predators. And there's other beetles that are here. I, I see dung beetles over on the manure pat busily working over here. So I've, I've been seeing a lot of beneficial insects. We know that we have a lot of birds. There's been birds continuously flying around us here and around the cattle behind us. These guys here at Willowbring Family Farm are just doing a fabulous job and in my opinion are setting the bar high yes. for other dairy farmers in their region. Well, we've had the entire time we've been standing here talking, we've had birds flying around us constantly picking off flies and other insects. And yet, if we walk right across the road to that cornfield, there's no birds flying over that cornfield. And if they are, they're flying over it this direction. to get to here. <laughs> they're on, they, right. got a, they, they, got a, they got a destination. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. it. So Kent, we're standing out in the middle of a complex cover crop field, and we want to demonstrate how to do a bricks measurement. So BRICS, B-R-I-X, is a measure of the dissolved solids in the sap or juice of a plant or a fruit or vegetable, doesn't matter. And those dissolved solids, many people think of the sugars, the sucrose and the fructose, and that's correct. That's certainly an important component of the dissolved solids. But those dissolved solids that we're measuring also incorporate proteins, free amino acids, 
minerals, lipids, and pectins. So in essence, doing a BRICS measurement on a plant is actually a quick and simple way to give us an idea of total nutrient density. And it's very simple to do this. We just use a, an instrument called a refractometer. So you're holding a modified vice press yep. and just simply we welded some plates here, curved plates that allow us to be able to extract the juices from that plant. And you'll demonstrate that. Mm -hmm. What I'm holding is a simple kitchen garlic press. But a heavy duty one. A heavy duty one. And so I'm gonna gather material and you ball it up and roll it around vigorously in the palm of your hand. Then I place rolled up plant material into the reservoir of my garlic press. And all we need are three or four drops onto the stage of our refractometer. And once we've got that, then I want to just gently lower the lid so that it forms a thin film of plant sap across the stage of that refractometer. And you have done the same. And the next step is pretty simple. We hold it up to the sunlight. There's an internal scale in here that goes from zero to 30. And we hold this up to the sunlight. And where the blue and the white field meet is where we take the bricks reading. We would like to see double digit bricks. So ideally, we want to get this bricks 10 or above. This is a very useful tool to help us assess which fields have peak bricks and are ready to turn our livestock into for optimum performance. We compound that even more by having a diverse forage mix throw on top of that management to take advantage of higher bricks compounding cascading consequences says you're going to benefit your bottom line is going to benefit your animals are going to benefit you're going to sell a higher quality product that's of more value yep. uh, your land's just going to continue to produce better over time it's just a win-win all the way around so kent we're the cattle were just moved into this pasture for the day yep uh, we we had the first move a few hours ago mm -hmm. and now we've got the second move of the day mm -hmm. and the cattle have actually only been here in here about 30 minutes now yes. and we can already see a fairly high degree of trample yes and as one of the things that we definitely want to do when we move cattle into a new paddock is we want to do keen observation mm -hmm. what do they look like what's their gut feel what are the manure pats mm -hmm. looking like and we also want to look at what are they selecting. And as we look at the majority of these cattle right now, we see excellent gut feel. Mm -hmm. They, instead of being extremely concave, they're pushing out, pressing out. Mm -hmm. And that's telling us that, you know, Derek is providing them with more than enough Atrophy. dry matter yes. to meet their needs. Yeah, the uh, red clover, uh, which is predominant out here and starting to mature and die back uh, was running a bricks of 17. Um, bricks again being the soluble minerals uh, in the plant most of that being sugar so it's a measure of energy. The orchard grass was 11 uh, and the chicory was 9 and the dandelion was 6. Not every animal is at the same place nutritionally on any given day and so when we give them uh, a diverse array of things to eat, they will select according to their need. What do these cattle need? They're heavy in lactation. Mm -hmm. What do they need to be able to perform in the parlor? Yeah, they need energy. They need energy and protein, but they really need energy. I mean, that's why in so many of our dairy herds, we're feeding grain, we're feeding corn, uh, you know, for that starch, for that energy. This is sugar, much more di digestible than starch. So here it is. Yes, it's right there. At a 17% bricks. Yep. So, and, and I've done quite a bit of bricks research in dairy cattle, mm -hmm. and what I do know that at a 17% bricks, this is going to be, if you're, if you're at 15% or above, mm -hmm. that's optimum for mm -hmm. performance, not in just fluid milk production, but also in components. Yes. So this is really the stage of maturity of the, of the clover 
that we want to be grazing. You know, when they're content, when they have what they need, uh, when their rumens are full, when they're comfortable, um, they're going to be quiet. They're going to be content. And, and that's what we want. That's, yeah. you know, cow comfort has been uh, a huge focus of the dairy industry for the last decade, if not slightly more. And, and these animals are comfortable and content out here. These cattle are also being used as a soil building and yes. carbon building tool yes. at the same time that we're providing them with plenty of nutrition mm -hmm. to perform in the parlor. Mm -hmm. So you actually can have both at yes. the same time. It, it's not one or the yes. other. Yes, they're a multi-purpose tool uh, exactly. when it comes to regenerative agriculture. It's six o'clock, Alan. It's dinner we've, time. We've had a good day, and uh, we've been able to do what both of you and I really enjoy doing, hanging out in pasture with cows. That's right.